Hello everyone. Are you ready to leave your seats soon? Echo. No? You have to be ready for that. All right, so uh, one of the things that actually we have been always speaking about, like when we were speaking about hubs, is identity, right? And like whenever we ask any hub manager or hub ambassador, who are you? Then it's very hard to describe. Because sometimes you know who are you, what are you doing, and like few knows how they are doing what they are doing, and very little who knows actually why they are doing what they are doing, right? And most of the times we describe ourselves with the what instead of the why. So it's very important for us actually to nail down some numbers today. I love data and numbers, so we're gonna go through a lot of numbers here. And because sometimes like we listen to many stories and the panel has been fantastically sharing a lot of insights on how to become sustainable. But also when we see the numbers, the narrative changes, right? Most of the cases, the narrative changes a lot when we see the numbers and we try to interpret them in a way that makes sense for us. So today I'll be sharing with you Hub in a Box, which is a format that actually we have co-created like with different networks, including AfriLabs, Impact Hub, and among other networks as well. And actually we have done the first one in 2015. That was actually, we invited the champions of hubs back then from different continents. And we said that we want to sit down together and do something interesting. What is that is basically we document all the stories we have in the room. So that was actually the big inspiration that we got. And while documenting these stories, we tried actually to make sense of the numbers we were getting. So we documented all types of content that we can get at that time. Statistics, YouTube videos, SoundCloud uh, tracks, uh, Britain blogs, among many others. And actually, we came up actually with a toolkit back then. And then for a while, the concept deteriorated. And then one year afterwards, actually in the gig in, in Berlin, we did a mini hub in a box. And it was focusing on financial sustainability aspects and crowdsourcing the, the financial sustainability from different hubs. All right, so I'm gonna share with you today like the different aspects that we got, but also you're gonna hear more from your side. And in the first panel, we got like a lot of questions. To, I'll ask similar questions to them, but like we will try to put them visually in a way that makes sense for us, in a way that we can take forward actually. So uh, in the beginning, actually, I would like to invite you all to stand up. Thank you. And maybe come here as well. Come closer here. We're gonna count each other. No, I'm just kidding. C can you come closer? We have been sitting for a while. So there was a question that was asked actually about like the sustainability, right? But like before asking the sustainability, I, we would like to do a spectrum of how sustainable your organization is. Your, your organization could be a digital innovation hub, could be an innovation hub, could be an incubator, could be an accelerator, could be a business support organization, could be an ESO, whatever your organization is, how sustainable it is. So if it's a super duper sustainable, then you should be on that side of the room. If it's not sustainable at all, unfortunately, you have to be on that side of the room. And if you are swinging in between, this is the right place for you. So it's, we have to do that in like 30 seconds. If you are super sustainable, go there, go there. We need, we need at the end, just a second, at the end we need one line. It's a spectrum, right? From zero to hero. And it's no shame to be not sustainable at all. I'll be there, I'll start that. I'll be here. If you are not sustainable, you are still struggling. There is no shame to say that loudly because this is, there is a lot of learnings that can happen here. We need one line, one straight line from here to there. And we have 30 seconds. We have 30 seconds for that. I think 29 now. No, one line. This is not a line, right? This is kind of a population of uh, amazing people coming together. OK, so if, if you don't have any of the, the organizations that I mentioned, and you were working with any of the hubs over the past year, and you ble believe that they are super sustainable, then th this is the right place for you. If they were not, then this is the right place for you. So here, there's an invitation for me here. Not sustainable. <laughs> OK. So we need to break that uh, coalition. Yeah, now it's got to get better. 
All right, while doing so, I would like actually to ask you to scan this QR code while the, the spectrum is being populated. If you can scan it, just like write minty.com and then enter the code. All right. Hopefully everyone, is it done? Okay, perfect. So the people who are swinging in the middle did it already. How about the sustainable people? Yeah? Those who are struggling, is it good? Are you still struggling or you got it? Okay. All right, so what does sustainability mean for you? If you are on that side of the room or that side of the room or in between, when we say sustainability, is it about finance, about governance, about team, about what exactly? About environment, could be. Mindset, I like that. Management, and management is coming in red, I don't know why, but yeah, that tells us something, right? Many of the cases that we have seen is like mal-management practices has been pushing hubs to fail, so it's important to see that. And sustainability for some people means smooth operation, and this is super important. Commitment, finance, show me the money, finance is getting bigger, business models, service providers, value, operations is coming again, impact, of course, team, management. Interesting. Okay, so finance is not moving, you see? <laughs> we need that money right in the middle. Nice. All right, that's interesting. So I want you to, to see who are the people beside you on that side, on that side, on that side, look to each other, because there is so much learning that we can get from each other, and that was the purpose actually of Hub in a Box, that we can crowdsource all of the insights that we have in the same room very quickly, probably over lunch, and then discuss that together. Get one practice that could work for you tomorrow, and instead of just like getting interesting like lessons to learn that is not applicable to you. So I would like to thank you so much. Give yourself a, like, a round of applause. We will continue, actually, it's not over yet. Thank you so much. You may be seated if you want. It's not moving, you see? But what, what I like the most here, that impact is coming up. Don't go back to your original seats, please. The purpose was to sit down together with those who were around you. All right. All right, so do you see this map? These were the people in the room when we initiated the mini hub in a box. They were coming from Africa, from South America, from Europe, from Asia, and they were all coming together with like amazing practices of failures. That was the case, actually. We were sharing a lot of interesting insights of how we failed, not fast in that time. It was failing dramatically. How did we come up after the failure that happened? How could we actually pivot? Because one of the things that we have seen, and that was before COVID, by the way, we have seen many hubs who started, for example, as co-working spaces. And over the time, they found out that they have their doors open, nobody is, nobody is willing to pay properly, and they are failing at the end because the profits are not actually paying off the bills. How many of us are in this stage today? I see some gestures, right? Yeah? Yeah, don't be shy. <laughs> so that, that's the case actually till today, it's too many of the co-working spaces, and we have seen actually some of the co-working spaces, and these are part of the trends that we have observed, emerging actually, emerging to be like the lady that was mentioning that in the, the, the previous panel, we are working, with the first revenue stream for us is real estate. She didn't say rental, she didn't say co-working, right? She said real estate. And this is one of the realizations that we have seen for some of the co-working spaces that emerged to be a real estate management office. So they take real estate, they increase the value of these real estate uh, spaces, and they, through increasing this value, they provide so much value for the real estate developers, right? And that was a model that actually emerged over Africa as well. 
And it's interesting to witness that. And we also have, especially after COVID, witnessed many cases of how co-working spaces, physical spaces, has shut down, not completely, but like these, like transformed all of their spaces to become virtual offices, either supporting, you know, concert service or supporting by different sets of uh, support that is needed for entrepreneurs, SMEs, corporates, among others, right? And it's interesting to see this evolution. The question is, if we are today struggling in our finance, then maybe what we have today is not the right model for us, right? So it's very important to realize it as early as possible. Otherwise, we'll stuck there and we'll lose more money. So that's why finance has been staying in the middle, right? Sustainability for me is not about finance. Finance is a tool for sustainability, not the purpose. But like what I've seen here was impact as well coming up. So if you have a strategy in place, if you have a strategy in place that you can take your hub forward and then operations would come afterwards, then you might become sustainable, right? And my question here is how many in the room of the hubs or, or the support organization have a written strategy? If you have a written strategy, you can raise your hand proudly. Nice, very nice. Like we have eight people in the room. 10, 12. Okay, how many have a strategy? Maybe not written. Just a strategy. Okay, more people are coming. Thank you. So actually, I know the, the following question is basically how many of us has no strategy, right? What the? <laughs> yeah, but basically it's interesting to see that there are more who have a strategy in place, but actually it's not in place, it's in mind. And it's very tricky because strategy, if it's in mind, with like whatever like noise you have today, you will forget about it for a while, right? And you will go to catch or chase this opportunity or this donor or this partner or this community, and you forget for a while your strategy. And at the moment you go back, you will regret that time because it's a, it's a precious time that you have lost chasing an opportunity that is not maybe aligned with your pathway, your strategy. So one of the things that I would love to see everyone is doing is basically having a written strategy, a simple one-pager strategy. It ha doesn't have to be 80 pages. One-pager strategy in place and break this strategy down into an operational aspect, what we would like to do, what we would like to achieve this quarter, next quarter, this year. Very simple, no like big words. And then make sure that everyone in your team knows it. But before doing that, ask yourself, do I have the right resources for that? Because in many cases, we have seen hubs emerging because they have seen other hubs emerging. Does it make sense or it sounds good, right? No, but like what I'm trying to say here that many hubs have started their journey because they have seen in other continents, in other cities, other hubs are like growing. There, there might be some money, some pictures over there, you know, interesting vibes, but actually they don't know why they are doing what they are doing. So it's very important here to know why we are starting our hubs. And if you started like 10 years ago, we might forgot why actually we have done that, right? This is part of the journey. And these people actually, when, we, when they came together, they were focusing together on three different things that matter the innovation hub ecosystem as a whole. One of them was basically the space rental and the community. And this is what I was reflecting on and how this evolves. And it's interesting here that it's not only about the physical space, but more of the community that is populating that space. More about the community that later on could provide programmatic approach to these spaces, right? And then afterwards we have the products and services. And this is very important because one of the things that you can find like your like financial freedom is basically by productizing your services. If you find yourself, and we have found that in the previous statistic, if you're offering more than 10 like services or products, this is a very kind of a big warning, right? Because definitely you are distracted at a, at a certain point. Definitely. So make sure that you streamline your processes. Make sure that you have like three to five products in place where you put all your efforts for a while, for a couple of years. And when they prove, and when I say prove means the data. So you have to be following a data-driven approach. Keep collecting data about what you're doing and if the data is telling you that this product is a failure, shut it down now, put it on the shelf, put it aside. And if the data is telling you that it's, it's moving on, it's, it's a big hope, it's a, it could be a big success, then put more efforts and resources in it. 
And this is very important. It's not about what you love to do. It's about like what works, what works for the community. And the community here could be entrepreneurs, could be corporates, could be governments, could be like academia, could be whatever stakeholders you work with, right? It's not only one single like community aspect. And the last one was basically incubation and acceleration. And we have seen an emergence between spaces who are just offering basic services like one week, uh, like once a week, basically a, like mixer or a networking event along the co-working. They emerged to be very strong incubators. And we have seen others who have done, done like a couple of incubation programs and then they didn't know, know how to survive because it's a resource intense process and they didn't manage to sustain it, right? So it's very important not to replicate the models that worked for others, but to replicate the models that works for you. And you'll never be able to do that unless you test and you keep testing and experimenting the process step by step. This is very crucial. If we just like hit the, hit the wall, full speed into one direction without like literally seeing where are we heading, we will hit the wall, easy, right? So it's very important here to have like these kind of probes all across the journey to make sure that, that we have the right team, we have the right structure in place that makes sense for the organization to grow. So if we see all of our team members focusing on the programmatic approach, we know that this is another big warning, right? Because we don't ha know anyone who is taking care of the business growth. We should have a business growth team in place, whatever you call it. Call it marketing, business development, sale, whatever the name. You should have this function in place, right? Because if you don't have this function, we will see the, the scenes that we have been seeing for a while. We have very interesting programs. We have shiny hubs, but after two years, they're struggling to pay the water bill, the electricity bill, right? The rental, the landlord is like, you know, running behind them. This is what happens on a daily basis, right? This is not like, you know, coming from the space saying that. This is, these are stories I actually have of witnessing myself. If you are still on Mentimeter, this is a question actually for, for us to, uh, just to put it. Why? Because I'll share it on LinkedIn for us all to access that. If you can answer it very briefly, it's the same spectrum that we have done here. Are we still figuring it out, the business model, the financial sustainability model, or we have found the secret sauce and became super suc successful and sustainable, or are we in between? I'll give you like a couple of seconds to do it. And uh, the good thing that we know the number of people who did it. So, and I know the people here. So please make sure that you use your internet and smartphones to do it, because it's interesting to do this kind of crowdsourcing for the data, for us all to learn. So how sustainable is your hub? I was happy in the beginning, like, you know, the orange one was hitting 10, but then it was coming back again. We have only eight people who did it, you see? We see the counter here. And I see those who are using their mobiles as well, and those who are not. So please help me, like, yeah, that's good. We are definitely more than 20 people in the room. We have three more questions to answer later. So help me like do that faster. All right, I'll move on while you keep doing that. But like a quick nutshell about like how is the ecosystem in Africa? Like a couple of years ago that uh, like statistic was done that we have like more than 1,000 tech hubs and these were the ones who were mapped. This means that I believe my story that they are multiplied by four at least. But like these are the only ones who are spotted, who are put in the report. They say 1,000, I, th I say 4,000. Yeah, and it's interesting to see that more than half of them are relying on co-working services. It's interesting, right? No? Is it interesting or not? Yeah, it's expected for me in a way. But it's interesting to see later on how the financial model of these spaces are struggling to sustain these co-working spaces. So more than half of them are relying on co-working spaces. And you can see here, like across the different countries, basically, that were mapped, the yellow means that the hubs are mainly relying on co-working spaces. And the black means that actually, they are offering programs, not only co-working. 
it's interesting to see that we have more yellow than black, right? Because it's more than half of them actually are lying on co-working. And I'd love to see that changing actually over the years because the only way to do is basically to package the services, the wisdom we have, the collective knowledge that we have, the resources that we have as hubs and offer this service to those whom they are interested at and they can pay for that. Do not offer these services for free. Yeah, here is another breakdown for them, how they are split over co-working, incubation, acceleration, maker spaces, and the networks in general. So, so that the previous slide was for Africa, and this one is for Europe. And it's interesting to see, to see like the differences between both of them. So basically here we see like more than 40% are representing business incubators and accelerators. In this case, not co-working, right? And then we have like the entrepreneurship and innovation centers taking 20% and then development and innovation agencies afterwards. And then the, split, the, the others are split over different types. Yeah, is it interesting? There are different models actually between Africa and how the emergence of the hubs there and in Europe. And it's interesting to see here also the, the ownership structure. I'll go through it very quickly. Yeah, so this is the ownership structure for the hubs in, in, in Europe in this case. So you see the business incubators and accelerators having more fully public, uh, like actually you have mixed public-private partnerships and then fully public than private. It's interesting. We don't have like similar statistics for Africa, but I'm curious to work on that project if anyone is interested, by the way. Okay, and then when it goes to entrepreneurship and innovation centers, it's mostly mixed, like public-private partnerships. So the public will not be able to do it on their own. The private will not take the risk for that. So it's basically, they are marrying together and doing that. And then when it goes to development and innovation agencies, of course, it's mostly public than others. And then the Science Parks is actually mix it, then fully public, and then later we have the university-based incubators and the support organizations that are affiliated to academia are more actually public. It's interesting to see here that there are a lot of public money, right? And here the conversation in Africa was basically, let's go away from the public money. This is a very important narrative to put in place. So in Europe, it's relying mostly on public or public-private. And the conversation that has been here was saying, let's go away of the public money and try to do it all on our, ourselves. The evolution that happened over there hasn't happened actually from the private pockets. It happened actually because public institutions, governments, like, and also here, it started to, be, to become the same uh, case. They started seeing that hubs are playing an important role with the different structures they represent, and they have to put more money into that, these structures Otherwise, they will be kicked out of the game. The game of innovation, entrepreneurship, like the continuous improvements of the existing products in the markets and so on. So it's very inter interesting to see that. And it's very important to remember that sometimes we put more pressure on ourselves saying we shouldn't get any public funding, but actually sometimes we should. But it's a matter of actually the strategy that we have in place. How are we putting that money into the strategy? How is that money financing the strategy to become more sustainable? Instead of just like shying away and saying, okay, we'll do it on our own. And then after a while, we, we beg sponsors to pay money for, for the programs, right? All right, so the cost structures or the top money suckers, as I call them, it was interesting to map what are the main cost structures that we have and what are the elements that sucks the money from our budgets, basically. So that's another question for you. You still have Mentimeter? If you run a hub, affiliated to a hub, you know any hub, it's interesting to see how, or actually what are the elements that takes the most of your money. If you finish fast, I'll show you what were the results in another group. So we have rental, electricity, staff, internet, customs and, and by the way, customs and equipment. Like we put these two because basically we were working a lot with makerspaces and fab labs and actually these two Elements were taking a lot of their budgets, basically. Okay. I see the staff is eating the, the money here. All right, so the equipment is also stretching over there. 
and the rental. Interesting. Okay. A, there are a lot of tension over there. So we only have 24 who did that exercise. Thanks a lot for those who did it. 29. I like how it uh, sprints fast, huh? So thanks for the 32. All right. It's interesting to see here that actually the staff is eating most of the budget. And this is not a surprise, actually, at all. If you see that, the staff was eating most of the budget, and then the rental, right? And then others were split between equipment and customs. So customs for like basically importing like spare parts, like electronic pieces uh, to run like the digital fabrication inside your, the, the countries of these hubs. But then it's very interesting to see that. So we have seen actually in, in many places in, in sub-Saharan Africa mainly, where electricity could be of a challenge in some of the places, electricity bills is on the top of, the, of their financial statements. They were on the top. And comes actually afterwards the internet. But then mostly the common thing was the stuff. And one of the things, again, that we have witnessed is the evolution of like how the stuff that was basically taking a lot of overhead as fixed cost, and this is one of the strategies that we have worked with many hubs to, to do, is basically to convert these fixed cost to a variable cost. What does that mean in finance? Anyone in finance here? No? No finance people here? Okay, so it's basically converting these fixed costs, basically the expenses that you are like, you should pay on a monthly basis, you switch them into variable costs. What does it mean? To affiliate these costs to programs, projects, activities, and so on. And what we found here, that while doing that, that was creating more employability. How? Because normally when we say we, we get rid of the stuff, this means that you lower the number of stuff you have, right? But actually the way we have seen it, that basically switching to remote work, allowing more flexible time for the staff to work, like onboarding more experts that might be, become affiliated to your organization, but also allowing them to work with other organizations so they evolve and like they learn more stuff and then they come back with much more mature experience for you. So it was bringing much more value for the hubs than trying to, to put that indicator of how many jobs are you creating on a full-time basis, because in many of the applications of proposals and so on, they ask this question. And actually, like in, in my case, from Ice Alex, we used to have like 37 full-time employees, and now we have 12. But actually, we are working with 100 experts more. Before, we used to work like with 10. So actually, the switch that we have done here allowed us actually to grow, because we were able actually to manage many, many programs but actually, we did a digital transformation for our old processes. So we mainstream, uh, we, we streamlined all of the processes that we have. We had a digital platform in place, manage everything, all the data. We have a data-driven approach, and that allowed us actually to work in more than 18 countries at the same time without having burnout. I have burnout, but yeah, the team not yet. Okay, so that's interesting to see. And basically, I'll just skip this one, but basically we see here that the staff was a priority for many hubs when we asked them what is the priority for you to cut costs they said staff and then rental and then equipment and then comes afterwards the electricity and internet and actually we have seen many collaborations happening between telecos and hubs to provide actually the the internet costs for example with a much more uh, like bigger uh, bandwidth and so on so there are a lot of modes of collaboration that could happen here and also for the staff, you can lease the human expertise that we have to other organizations if you want to keep them on your payroll. That was actually another strategy that we have seen in many hubs. So the question here is basically, speaking about costs, one of the strategies is basically we, how could we lower the cost as possible, right? But also, there is another uh, strategy saying, let's increase the, the revenues that we have, right? So speaking about revenues, I think you were asked a lot about what are the, the top revenue streams that you have. We have listed these seven. If you can contribute to them quickly via Mintimeter, it would be amazing to see that. So we have workshops and community events, space rental, programs like incubation, acceleration, research. And that was an interesting thing that we have seen many hubs emerging to be like think tanks or research centers and selling the data in a way that makes sense for both of them. 
And then also we have consulting and professional services. And I think Paul was mentioning that many spaces emerge to be like program management offices and consulting offices. And we have also private investments. And of course, we have grants and donor funding. We can see that easily, right? But now we can see it and say that it's not a shame to have grants and donor funding, but actually it's a matter of when you get it and how you get rid of it. Uh, you know when you get rid of it, because it's very important not to be trapped in this rat race, right? All right. So we have 12 contributors. Thanks a lot for that. Can we get more? We have 14. Thanks for those 14 who contributed. All right, so we have 18. But like, yeah, so whatever the number of people who are contributing, the donors are not moving away, right? That's interesting. Some observations, you know. <laughs> but also we see that programs here are becoming more stronger when we get the collective. Consulting is losing its place. No, coming back. Yeah? And then workshops and community events are competing, unless COVID comes, right? But actually, we have seen that a lot of moods of uh, virtual events that were happening. And it's interesting to see that before, some of the spaces were doing like events and people were not paying. And when they switched it virtually, they asked people to pay for the events and they were paying. I don't know why. <laughs> if anyone knows, like I'm curious to know as well. But we have seen that happening, actually. It's an interesting shift. But actually, my two cents here is basically if you offer something that people need, they will definitely pay for it. If you teach them not to pay, they will get used to it. So it's very important here, it's a matter of mindset, but also it's a matter of the, how you design your programmatic approach, how you design the services you have. Is it replicating models that work somewhere else or building models that actually relying on the real needs of your community? This is super important. And here we see, this is a nice picture to take and to, come, to reflect on later. We have donor funding, programs, Consulting and professional services, workshops and community events, research, space rental is coming at the sixth place, private, private investments among others. Can I ask those who put others, what are the other revenue streams that you have? Maybe we hear from one or two. If you put others here, what were the other revenue streams that you put? No? No one put others? Yeah, please. Just very briefly. So, as I said earlier in the first meeting, selling of products, like electronics components, mm. yeah, because we are into maker space uh, and robotics generally. So, that's the other side of the box. Nice. And it's interesting, reflecting on the makerspace model also, we have seen that many of the makerspaces were like providing, so they have equipment, right? So, the make, the, what makes sense is selling products. But actually, they were selling the service of having the equipment, access to these facilities, right? But also, this model is similar to the co-working space model where you try to allow the physical assets that you have to become, you know, uh, leased in a way, but that actually was not proving uh, to be very sustainable. So making sure that you can offer one product, two products, three products that make sense for your stakeholders and focusing on selling them makes more money than trying to lease the equipment that you have. It's important to consider that. Can you say it loudly? That's amazing. So you were relying on the expertise that you have as human resources, the big paycheck that you have, and then making sure that these people are providing big value for your hub, for your organization or your collective organization, and then selling that to those who are in need, right? Because you're an expert in that. And another model that we have seen is basically uh, corporate innovation programs and how the hubs are playing big role in that. And this was happening more in more matured ecosystems than uh, nascent ecosystems, because basically in more mature ecosystems, corporates were interested actually to move their products differently, innovatively, 
but they don't know how. So the best place to go was basically to see what is the best hub in town. Let's collaborate with this hub and make sure that we have a corporate innovation program that allows open innovation to happen so others can innovate for us as corporates in that sense, but also us can share with them the needs and the market insights for this industry, right? So it's, it's a win-win thing. So it's very important to see this kind of evolution and to see where are we today as hubs. Each one of you has to f reflect in his or her journey and see how could you evolve with the data that you are collecting. So one of the things that was mentioned in the morning was basically, do you have like the, you, do you have like the books in place? Do you have your books in place? Do you know what are the revenues? What are the percentage of each of these revenues in your, uh, in, in your financial statement or not? Because it's very important. It's not a one-year thing for th taxation, right? It's a very systematic process that has to happen each week, each month. Because if you don't know what is eating your budget, and then just like being surprised at the end of the year, and you don't know what is contributing the most to your, uh, your space, then you are losing a lot of value, right? And then you are contributing more to the burnout of yourself and your team and losing actually what you're doing. They're putting pressure for the lunch, uh, but basically it's interesting to see how these actually sources of funding also were being uh, clustered here. So we, we have seen like more corporate sponsor in place, more private money being put here, also for those who are offering incubation and acceleration programs and evolving to be venture studios. So and a lot of DFIs actually started being realizing that this is an interesting place to be, but they need the hubs to speak the language of the DFIs because they speak actually different languages and they might need banking intermediary uh, in between to translate the, the two worlds together, together. All right, so this is like a quick graph about like the different revenue streams that you can do. But again, if you do all of them, before we used to do all of that, by the way, and then we get rid of everything and then we package them into two to three products and then we focused full force on that. And now we have more than 12 programs in place, but actually we know why we are doing what we are doing, who is paying for that, and we, we streamline the processes inside the team. So it's very important, again, to do this exercise, even though you believe that this might waste your time. It's an investment, actually, in your uh, hub sustainability in general. So I leave us on that uh, note, that basically, with the different structures and categories of hubs and innovation hubs and spaces, there is actually a different contribution of revenue streams that could come from different sources. It could be public money, it could be grants and subsidies, for example, it could be programs coming from the EU or AU, hopefully, and also like some revenues from the rental and the real estate uh, thing, and also from like investment funds and DFIs, as I was mentioning, and revenues from other typical business support services. So it's interesting to see that. And it's important to build one similar graph for each of us, for each of the hubs. Because if we don't know what's happening inside the hub, and if we have one revenue stream eating more than 30 to 40% of our overall revenues, then this is the third warning that we have. If you have one revenue stream that is contributing to more than 40% of your overall revenue, make sure that you should change that today because tomorrow you'll, you might not find the money. If this player decided not to pay, you are in a tricky position. So better not to put yourself in that position. And better to be in a position of strength, understanding your value very well, to negotiate the contracts, to negotiate the pricing, to negotiate the value that you are offering in the way that you are good at. So it's about like matching the resources that you have with the needs of your stakeholders. And it's very important to leave it here. I, I hope like the conversation that we had together was insightful. I tried to put numbers. I don't know if people like numbers or not. Sometimes it's boring, but I hope like these numbers you can reflect on, get some insights and think about where I am today, why I'm doing what I'm doing, how can I actually do something different? Because tomorrow I, w I want to be in a, a different place. And I hope like we are late for lunch. Okay, thank you. I see it here actually, but we're not here. All right, so thank you so much. And it's important to see that this is the valley of death that happens to the startups and actually happens to the hubs, and if you believe in you are in the growth stage, be aware that it comes twice. So make sure that you don't fall in, into that trap. Thank you so much, and uh, yeah, I'd be interested to keep in touch over LinkedIn or over lunch. Both could be uh, the best option for me. And uh, bon appetit. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much. Can we give him another round of applause?